Welcome back. You're now watching the political segment on The Weekend Show. Today's episode of uh, on the political segment is supported by the National Crime Agency of the United Kingdom. Since the creation of Niger, and even before that, we've always had one form of conflict or the other. Now, sociologists will tell you that there's no system or society without conflict. What we now see, however, is the evolution of different forms of conflict. Sometimes it's tribal, sometimes it's religious. Since 2008, Nigeria has been battling with some form of insecurity, especially when it comes to the issue of insurgency. With the um, administration of President Muhammad Buhari, we did see a bit of displacement of the Boko Haram insurgents in different parts of the country. Unfortunately, the new threat and trend has now become kidnapping and abductions. We've also seen a bit of insecurity or a lot of insecurity in the Middle Belt or the not central parts of the country. It begs the question, are these crimes evolving? Are the displaced criminals not moving into other places? Could it also be as a result of the Kujé prison um, escape, where we now have a lot of people on the loose? This is a problem because now in the federal capital territory, just this January, we've had several reports of kidnappings and abductions and cases of robbery and theft. Most people have stated that while we try to fix insecurity from law enforcement, what do we do about the mindset and orientation of the people? Several parastatal agencies and people have been given this task and they are working in their own ways. However, it's important for the people, for you and I, to know what's in place and how we can do better and work together with these organizations, institutions and parastatals to ensure that we all play a role in the peace, security and unity of our country. And joining me, I have Mr. David Akuji, who is the Director of Special Duties, States Operations, National Orientation Agency, returning back on the weekend show to have this conversation. Happy New Year and welcome back on the weekend show. Thank sir. you very much, Andy. Always a pleasure to be Always with you. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Um, one of the facts or the reasons why I like having these conversations with you is that most people shy away from such conversations. <laughs> but for you, you have nowhere to run. <laughs> but even besides that, I've seen you in several other places. So I know you're not just talking, you're actually working on part of several high level conversations mm. to fix these issues. Let's talk about, let's start with insecurity in Nigeria. A mm. general overview, what's your take on that? Well, um it's unfortunately a very complex situation that we find ourselves in when you talk about insecurity. And this has lasted for decades. Um, in your intro, you talked about um, conflicts of various kinds, you know, and being driven by various considerations. Um, peace in itself is defined by some scholars as not exactly the absence of conflict, but the ability to manage conflict in such a way that uh, the, the, the damages are minimized to the barest minimum because conflict is as old as mankind. And this is established in all major religions when you look at our origins, you know, and how man came uh, about. What's going on in this country is terrible. And one of the key factors that's um, driving it and sustaining it for as long as these decades that we've seen it happen is our misinterpretation of the context that creates this conflict. Whenever conflict happens, you find that the purveyors and perpetrators of these conflicts take it to the domains of our natural, national fault lines. What are those fault lines? Tribe, region, religion, you know? And they, make, they play up these factors such that it now overshadows the criminality of the acts of violence that are being created. Someone gets up and slaughters another person. That's a crime. It doesn't matter what religion you come from. It doesn't matter what uh, region or tribe you, know, you belong to. But we have been having challenges, to my mind, in mustering the leadership uh, courage you know, from all sectors to deal with these issues as crime. Because we play up our natural fault lines, the issues have persisted. And you see that very few, if any, 
have been decisively punished in ways that establishes an example as deterrence for others who would go into uh, this kind of crimes. You talked about the insurgency, the origins of Boko Haram. And those who will t talk to you about the origins of Boko Haram will tell you that it goes back into politics. The politics of that time in Borno State threw up a certain gentleman, gave him privileges, you know. These are the accounts that you have of the origins uh, of it. And then suddenly decided to cut him off, you know, and, and brush him to insignificance and all of that. And you see the backlash. And that's what we're dealing with till this very day. So those factors, alongside with the gullibility yeah. of our youth and the pervasive ignorance, you know, in uh, most rural areas in our country, have uh, served as fuel, you know, to drive this thing. And you rightly, you are correct when you say that it's manifesting in various forms. It's mutating. Yeah. You know, what started from the Northeast that was variously misinterpreted and which caused delays. You know, the perception that the government of that time at the beginning had about this, they thought it was politics, you know, that some people were trying to create problems to make one government look uh, bad. Some others thought it was religion, you know, and so they dealt it from that premise, from that window. And you see the outcome now. It's mutating. It's becoming kidnapping. It's becoming cattle rustling. It's becoming banditry. And today we have... The, the, the challenge pervasive in every part of the country. Some parts of the country felt that it's not happening in our region, so it's not our business. But today, <laughs> they are yes. affected, right? So mm -hmm. what we are doing at National Orientation Agency is to build a national consensus, to paint a common picture so that we all know that, look, this thing affects us. And unless as citizens and as government, we put out the right kind of responses, it has the capacity to consume us all. What you see happening in Plateau, in Katsina, in Zamfara, and all of that, if allowed to continue to fester the way it, it, it's going on, then there's nothing stopping it from spreading to every part. You see it's coming into FCT now. And even in FCT, the narrative is becoming a bit confusing. Yeah. You know, they're talking about politics. Exactly. And, and I know? found that very weird seeing that come up in the last week. And mm -hmm. you've made very germane points about us forgetting the criminality of mm -hmm. what has gone on to focusing on these fault lines mm -hmm. like you have mentioned. Um, and I see what has happened in places like Mango in Plateau State in Bokos. And, and I said that in my introduction this morning that for each person killed, that's a human life mm -hmm. with a name, with a background, with family and connection. But people just say, oh, 100 people killed. What's going on? Is it Christians versus Muslims? Yeah. Is it the governor's local government? and the like, without focusing on the fact that this is criminality criminal. and there should be deterrence yes. um, for it. Most of the states now have dealt death penalty for kidnappers, for instance, mm -hmm. but none of the governors are willing to sign <laughs> any execution order. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the criminality, do you think that if there are more convictions and that will to show that this is being tackled and the perpetrators are being brought to book. Do you think that would play a major role in working on the psyche of the people to know that there's confidence in the system? Well, Andy, the truth is this. If you take out punishment, if you take out holding people to account for their actions, there will be no incentive for people not to do the wrong things. And this applies to any country of the world, you know? Yeah, those advanced countries that you travel to, United States, Britain, France, and all of that, where you see that there's order, is because people know that if you go against the law, even if it takes 60 years. In the US, there are people who committed crimes and were brought to book 50 years after. True. You know, so there's an unrelenting effort on the part of state to keep pursuing until wrongdoers, no matter how long it takes, until wrongdoers are caught and brought to book. So with that knowledge at the back of your mind, that you won't get away with it, mm -hmm. it's a huge difference. But here, people are doing terrible things. We are unable to locate them. We are unable to track them and bring them to justice swiftly, you know? And then we are characterizing all of these crimes, you know, with a toga of religion, of tribe, 
of region and all of that, uh, that's why it has festered for this long. No matter what religion you belong to, no matter what tribe, what region, or what political party you come from, if you commit a crime, the law should take its course. That's the only way you fix these things. One of the solutions um, previous and current governments have used, um, and, and you know this, lately everybody's talking about non-kinetic approach, non-kinetic approach. We had the Niger Delta militants, and at some point they got amnesty. We had the Boko Haram insurgents, and we've heard about rehabilitation for them, and some form of amnesty in some quarters, also with bandits. Mm. Just last week, the vice president represented by his chief of staff at um, a, a dialogue on tackling security in northern Nigeria, pledged another 50 billion naira for tackling um, these issues in the states. And while two things can exist at the same time, doesn't this have a negative role in letting these people know they can get away with it? I see the Niger Delta, some of the former perpetrators of violence are now supporting security services. Yeah. Do you think this not, is time for a non-kinetic approach or we're being too soon with these solutions and just throwing money at the problem? No, I think uh, we actually are at a time when non-kinetic response is pertinent, very, very uh, important. Now, I did read also about that response from the yeah. president through the vice president. Um, I am hoping that this time around the right thing will be done, mm. that the office of the vice president will reach out to the director general of National Orientation uh, Agency because throwing money is not enough. You also need a narrative to go along with those interventions so that the people interpret those interventions in the right context. And that's where National Orientation uh, Agency comes in. I'm deeply hopeful, you know, that the office of the vice president will not make the kind of errors that previous administrations have made to relegate National Orientation Agency to the background and which has impacted negatively on the entire response. Yeah. Last year, we held a national summit of stakeholders on non-kinetic response to the various insecurities that are going on uh, in different regions you know, across this country. And we came up with um, a, a report. You know, We were prepared to lead that effort. National Orientation Agency is structured and purposely made to lead national narrative and change of behavior and reorientation. That's the reason why that agency uh, is established. So when the nation is putting in place a framework to respond and they don't include National Orientation Agency, then you just wonder what this is um, all about. I'm hopeful that this time around it will not be the same. Uh, Non-kinetic response will serve several purposes. You know that uh, the pool from which the drivers of this insecurity draw in terms of manpower you know, are innocent people, yeah. are people who are deprived, who don't feel the impact of government. So the first thing I notice about this response that 50 billion is being put into in Adamawa, Borno, Benue, and yes. some of these states along that axis, is that there will be intervention in terms of road construction, in terms of uh, medical services, in terms of educational facilities and all of that. Now, these are some of the things that are lacking that have made us to now have a huge pool of youth that are idle and ready to be recruited into very negative um, vices, you know. So if this kind of intervention happens, then it creates a sense of hope. But there has to be a proper narrative following this intervention. There has to be reorientation and change of behavior, modification. And that's where National Orientation uh, Agency comes in. So I'm waiting and hopeful that this time around they won't just go doing this thing and then the impact is lost and we have sunk in so much money yeah. and benefited so little. I mean, a quick segue to that, um, mm. when you spoke about roads and infrastructure, mm. we must give some credit, to, uh, give credit to the previous administration of Mohamed Buharu when it comes to infrastructure in some cases. Mm. But this is why orientation and amplification comes in. Mm. I went to Benue State about two weeks ago mm. And we now have a dual carriage road all the way from Abuja down 
to Makodi, mm. which now reduces crime on the road because most times they use the bad roads and those places Absolutely. to cause that. And so traveling has become safer. Mm -hmm. And just like you rightly said, if these resources are put in the right places, mm -hmm. it could create employment mm -hmm. and reduce some of these security issues. Yes, yes, yes. But let's come back to kidnapping. And kidnapping has been ongoing, but it's getting scarier because it's now at the center, um, Governor Wick, um, well, the Minister of FCT Wiki has um, called all the security heads to have a briefing on it. I know the Minister of Defense has done that, and also the presidency. Some people are even calling for a state of emergency on kidnapping. What do you think from a national orientation agency can be done to tackle kidnapping in Nigeria at the moment? I think that um, the is need for a multi approach, you know? And I think what, um, what the National Security Advisors Office is doing at the moment is very apt. That certainly is the way to go. Mm -hmm. There needs to be synergy in terms of intelligence, in terms of response, in terms of pervasive national narrative, you know? So if you have these three things working together, uh, we would make a lot of headway. And talking about kidnapping, um, you need to subdivide the, 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 the typologies of this kidnapping that is going on. Because it's not all the same. There's kidnapping that is being done by very dangerous uh, bandits and insurgents for the purpose of getting funds to buy more arms and ammunition. Now, even among them, there are those who are not core criminals like the bandits and the insurgents, but they see the lifestyle that kidnapping is enabling these ones to live, the opulence, you know, and the criminal respect that they get from their peers, you know, around that. And then um, they decide also to embark on it, not for the same purpose, but just to get the material uh, benefits. And then you see what's going on on our campuses too. Kidnapping is happening on our campuses. Yeah. You know, cult groups, you know, and criminal groups on campuses kidnapping fellow uh, students just to get some money to feed their negative passions, you know, drugs, you know, and all of that and so on and so forth. So if you segregate the causative factors that's driving these kidnappings, then it becomes easier to solve. You know that there isn't a one size fits all. But the one that I think bothers us the most is this one that's been perpetrated by the insurgents and the bandits for the purpose of acquiring more resources mm. to buy more ammunition, to inflict more injury <laughs> on uh, citizens. That's a huge cause for worry. And that calls for intelligence. It also calls for decisiveness. We're at a point in this country where we don't need to be told again. We need to set aside those fault lines, religion, tribe, region, political inclinations. We need to decisively deal with these criminals, no matter what religion or tribe they come from. We need to pick kingpins and then publicly make examples of them so that those who are admiring them can see the end that awaits people who perpetrate and go into this sort of um, lifestyle. Mm. You know. So, but um, what's happening at ONSA at the moment, I believe will add um, a, lot of, a lot of value Okay, let's talk about the youth. Um, and I recall you mentioning this offline about the NOA has its imprint across the nation. Mm -hmm. So besides Coca-Cola and INEC, I think <laughs> NOA has legs everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and information gathering and sharing plays a huge, huge role where the young people can share information and collaborate with the NO and this can now be transferred to the intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. What role can the people play in um, ensuring and enhancing security from the local level, from the villages, the communities, and down to the state, to mm -hmm. the top? You see, the day before yesterday, I was at an event um, where the minister, and several other personalities were also there. And the discussion uh, came around the challenge of insecurity. Uh, the deputy governor of Katsina State was there. And he said something that is, uh, serves lesson learning purpose to other state governors and to people like us also. Um, they went into the communities and did some kind of survey. 
and they discover that the guys who are perpetrating, even the bandits and the insurgencies who are perpetrating this, are known people in the communities. Mm. They are not spirits. They don't fly. They move on the road. They go on motorcycles. You know, they drive, and people know them. You know. But what the community is doing currently around those areas, what the community had been doing before the intervention that Katsina State Government made, was uh, everyone was so intimidated, and then the majority of people became informants to the bandits and the other way around, yeah, the yeah. insurgents, you know. But with the calculated intervention that Katsina State Government did, recruiting over 1,460 volunteers, you know, people mm -hmm. recruiting them, arming them, training them, you know, and deploying them in communities. Kazina State Government has been, has now made, uh, what do you call it, informants to become very unpopular. Mm. You understand? And that has reduced the capacity for intelligence gathering for the bandits and has put the conventional military on a sure foot towards dealing with them. And so in Kazina State, because of that intervention, the rate of kidnapping and all those crimes that are perpetrated by bandits is seriously uh, diminishing. So you see, citizens have a great role to play. Yeah. And unless they are galvanized deliberately, intentionally, to play that role in favor of the state, which is in place to protect them, they will play that same role in favor of the perpetrators you know, of, the, of the crime. So citizens need to be made aware of this. And again, it's a question of orientation. You know, of reorientation and mindset uh, change. So, besides the criminal element, um, there's also the role poverty plays in insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for some people, they've now seen this as a lucrative business and it's like, oh, I've got a degree, I don't have work, and the likes. From the top, and this is from the presidency. <laughs> What do you think the presidency needs to do uh, to show political will in this fight against insecurity and kidnapping? Well, you are right about that. We live in the digital age where information travels pretty fast. Yeah. You know, because of the internet, uh, its instantaneity, you know, and the pervasiveness of social uh, media, people are able to get to know a lot of things. Unemployment is a huge challenge. This government is aware of that. Several initiatives are being rolled out to tackle it. Uh, currently, we are not in such a good place in terms of finances and funding to accomplish all the goals you know, that the government had set out for itself. But there are a few initiatives that are unfolding. And I can tell you one or two that's creating benefits and opportunities to keep our youths engaged and busy. On the part of National Orientation Agency, we had entered an arrangement with a non-governmental organization called Nigerian Youth Volunteers. In developed countries, volunteerism is leveraged to keep retirees, to keep uh, youths who have finished and all, keep everybody busy. You know, it creates opportunities for you to go and do something. You may not get a salary, but you can get an allowance, a stipend, you know, that keeps you going and serves as a stopgap in between that place where you finished NYC and all of that, and before you get another opportunity for a job. One of the things that government is doing right now through the National Communications Commission, uh, the Department of Digital Economy, is to empower such youths. Mm. And they're working with us at National Orientation Agency, leveraging on our partnership with the Ni Nigerian youth volunteers, you know, because that's where we have the database. We have a huge database of youths across this country who have volunteered. We've given them ID cards, we've given them certificates, you know, and all of that. And, and we're creating opportunities for that to become an advantage to them. We have their database, mm. you know. So with uh, Nigerian Communications Commission, what we're doing at the moment through the Department of Digital Economy is they are giving them devices and then they are training them on how to leverage the opportunities in the digital space to keep themselves busy, you know. So that's one intervention through inter- uh, agency collaboration, yeah. working also with non-governmental organizations. That's the model that we have put in place at the National Orientation Agency. We intend to extend that relationship also to uh, National Identity Management Commission. You know we have not met our mark in terms of digital identity registration. Yeah. And some of the challenges that have created that uh, situation is the fact that there are so little points of registering. 
in our villages. And you know, the rural areas will form larger population than the urban cities. That's true. You know, we don't have presence in villages for digital identity registration. Again, we are looking at this model of using the Nigerian youth volunteers uh, working with NIMSI. And that process has been kickstarted already, working with NIMSI to train people, youths, these mm -hmm. volunteers, on these digital registration skills. And then in the villages, they can set up as agents, you know, registration points. So when people want to register uh, a NIM in order to be eligible for JAMP, eligible for WAEC, and all those other social services that are government, they don't have to travel far from their villages. They know that there's a point in my village where I can go to and readily get this done. So we are scanning the environment and looking at the policies, programs, and activities that are being done by other ministries, departments, and agencies to um, eke out such opportunities that will benefit to keep the youth uh, busy. I think that's a great, um, th those are great strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to scale them yes. to accommodate more people. Mm -hmm. The states have a big role to play. Yeah. Most times, a big mistake we make is just waiting for everything to be done from the center, from Abuja. Mm -hmm. State governors also have to support and take this initiative Absolutely. Um, to be inclusive. And we also do then um, partners such as the National Crime Agencies that have um, supported us to be able to have conversations like this yeah, absolutely. and supporting work around um, anti-kidnapping. But most importantly, I want to say thank you to you <laughs> and the National Orientation Agency for always um, being a voice and coming on to explain the situations to us and provide um, solutions. Thank you so much. David Akuji is the Director of Special Duties and State Operations at the National Orientation Agency. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, sir. Pleasure is always oh, mine, Andy. I'm always Always happy to be with you here. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. sir. We'll take a quick break. When we return, more on the weekend show. Don't go away.